film exposes the addictive nature of pornography, how pornography addiction is a root cause of family breakdown, and how it drives violence and sexual crimes against women and children. This film is not intended, however, to imply that the majority of pornography viewers will end up committing sexual crimes or that the individuals who appear in this film have committed such crimes, unless they specifically indicate so. If you or a family member struggle with a pornography addiction, please know there is hope and that many have found healing and recovery through therapy and family support. My first exposure to pornography was around age eight. I was uh, probably uh, eight or nine years old and I stumbled upon some uh, pictures of pornography. It was more when we, after we were married that he discovered it when we had it coming through our TV in a rapid, excessive, anytime, 24 seven hour rate. So my first experience with pornography was at my cousin's house and it was on this gaming device with internet connection and I don't think his parents even knew that it had internet connection. And so he was first exposed to pornography when he was seven or eight years old, he thinks. And a lot of times I'd hide him under my bed or, or in my dresser, that sort of thing. And I'd flip back to him. I felt naturally drawn to them. Go to the library and, and, and try to find books that were exciting uh, of sexual nature. Like while you're looking at it, I, I suppose it's like a, it's thrilling. Like it's, you know, it's awesome while you're in it. But then afterwards it's just, I guess this feeling of like disgust and shame and um, like, why did I just do that? You know, what was the point of that? And he did get in trouble even in kindergarten for having cut out like the underwear ads, he and his friend, and they had those on their desks in kindergarten. So one of the fascinating things that's been happening over the last 10 years is because of technology, we've been able to see how pornography and sexual addiction affects the brain. Pornography is a drug which produces an addictive neurochemical trap. It is a pheromone. It changes the set point, the pleasure set point of the brain, and creates a new normal through the process of neuroplasticity, or change in the way our brain perceives and values pleasure. Learning about the addiction has been what has really helped me to realize that it's not me. It's not between me and some other woman. This is something that's wrong with his brain. It's not just a morality issue, right? That this is a brain issue, that these behaviors affect your brain and your ability to be able to function in your life. But learning about the changes in the brain and the steps that can be taken to actually reverse those changes, that damage, that really gave me hope. So one transmitter is dopamine, and that's centered part of our pleasure and reward system of our part of our brain. And dopamine's released in it whenever there is a sexual experience and something that we, gives us a kind of a high in order for us to want to continue to seek out that same activity. Have anything bad happen to me, that would be my quick fix. And, you know, give me that dopamine rush, make me happy again, or at least numb the pain. It is as destructive, if not more so, than other even hard drugs. I had periods of time where I, I just gritted my teeth and, and white knuckled through it, but inevitably, I always fell back into it. As we're engaging in those behaviors, oxytocin and vasopressin is released, that bonds us to those activities. So we educate our clients about the neurological pathways, because this isn't just about their willpower or them being weak and not being strong enough. It's about the things that are going on in their brain. You're playing with fire. Uh, when you become uh, a watcher of pornography because you don't know how your brain is going to interact with pornography. You know, these are good men They're, and women, good people. These are not people who are going out looking for that. They're people who are coming across it innocently. So where they may have started off with some very basic pornographic images, it has a tendency to escalate, going to massage parlors, going to escorts, seeking prostitutes, looking to hook up with anonymous individuals online. Progression from nudity to hardcore sexual acts, bestiality, sadomasochism, child porn. What the brain is really searching for is something new. Novelty, change. Pornography capitalizes on that. It can extend to various things. Not everybody falls into all those categories but each one of them falls into some category where it continues to escalate. Very rarely have I seen somebody who started with pornography and it just stayed basic pornography. So for me, I started out with just pictures and that was it that did it for me. And then 
it got progressively worse. It got stories, videos, intense videos, long videos, um, and there didn't seem to be an end. I had come to realize that it's not just men looking at pictures. It's, it's something that changes in the brain. And um, that was a real a page turner for me, that I realized, okay, this is something that needs professional help. Now I'm a marriage counselor. About 90% of the people I see with marriage issues have pornography issues as well. And I'm convinced that that is the central cause. The isolation, the shame, the dishonesty, the lies, that's the central cause of marriage disharmony today. As I told her, I remember just, just shaking. I, I broke down into tears. I was so ashamed of myself. Do I divorce him? Do I keep married? We have a child coming. You know, we're butting heads because I'm trying to say what you did is terrible, crazy, terrible, and I'm angry and I'm mad and I'm, I'm like a cat in a cage. I'm just like, you know, I just want to, you know, tear him to pieces. And, and he's just trying to protect himself. You know, he's getting found out and he has other deeper, uglier things that he's hiding still. And all of this time, all of this money, all of this effort that has been put towards a sexual addiction, you could be something incredible. When he would do that, I would know what was going on, but he would lie about it continually. And then you start to not trust yourself. And this is the destructive power of pornography, that it disrupts our primary relationships. Without pornography, if an individual is distressed, their instinct sends them to their loving relationships, to a spouse, or to a friend, uh, but with pornography addiction present, uh, they go internal. They don't reach out, they reach in to themselves, to their own sexual behavior. His story was more of a telling me, don't worry about it, every guy does it, every guy needs it, uh, it's normal, it's healthy. I spent so much time trying to figure out what was truth and what was a lie, and I would look back at pictures and they would just make me sick because I thought, well, you were lying. And not only did I have to go get tested, he went and got tested when I was on the table, you know, gynecologist table, and we were going over what I could possibly have, you know, chlamydia, syphilis, herpes, and then she started talking about, we're gonna test you for HIV, we're gonna test you for AIDS. I don't think there is a time in my life when I've ever felt so defeated as a woman and a wife and a lover and a friend and a human being. So the problem is these men are viewing these images of women and have fantasies of these women that don't have any needs and are just there to fulfill their needs. And so when the real women in their lives have needs, they become angry and resentful about it. And Nicholas Tenbergen, who won the Nobel Prize in 1973, described a supernormal stimulus. He first started with birds. He painted bird eggs bigger and prettier than normal bird eggs and found that the birds would leave their own eggs and roost the plaster eggs because they were bigger and prettier. It was a, a higher, supra normal over what they encountered in nature. Then he painted female butterflies' wings bigger and brighter than normal female butterflies, and these male butterflies actually mated or tried to with the paper female butterflies and ignored the real female butterflies. Nobody can compete with altered, fake, over-enhanced, and absolutely extreme pornography. You have this, this virtual attachment to, uh, to these artificial humans. It's not reality, and I think that's, that's the problem, is that the men get sucked into that and then they expect it, and then the women feel like that's what they need to be. And I don't want this dull, normal. I want exciting. I want new. I want enhanced. It dysfunction, erectile dysfunction result. Pornography is leading to sexual dysfunction. Psychology Today Online had an article uh, two years ago about something they called porn-induced sexual dysfunction. And what they said is it's a problem for guys in their 20s. They've been looking at pornography for 10 years by that time, masturbating to it, and that's imprinted on the brain. That's where they get their sexual excitement. We're finding men younger and younger are having difficulties with erectile dysfunction because what they have found arousing in the pornography they're not able to achieve in their experiences with women.
I went through the days, but I wasn't living. I, you know, I looked at pornography every day in order to self-medicate. I would cut myself because I would so much rather feel physical pain than emotional pain. And My husband got to the point where he was so despondent. He thought many, many times about taking his own life. I hated myself, you know, hated God, hated everybody. You know, why me? Why, as a child, for crying out loud. Pornography images are resulting in a massive shift in the way our children are developing their sexual template. The premature sexualization of our youth is, is at an all-time high, and it's only going to continue to get higher based on the trends that we're seeing. You know, you become sexualized as a six, seven, eight-year-old kid, joking about it, kind of following the lead of what this pornography is taking you. Psychologists say that, uh, you know, it's not like uh, some casual observation that you see that flits on the mind and goes out. It's permanently imprinted on the mind. And those children, as much as they would like to, cannot escape those memories and escape those images. I still remember those images of what I saw as an eight-year-old child. Uh, I can't remember what I did last week, but I, these things, I, they, they just stuck with me. But when they go to the internet with curiosity, they're not going to get healthy, good information about sexuality, what they're going to get is a vast array of pornography uh, that doesn't educate them well about what sex really is, about what relationships really are. They get the opposite. The children aren't in the capacity to make informed, long-term decisions about that. Again, we're learning much more about the brain. Children's brains are very uniquely unadapted to that. Remember, their frontal, frontal lobes aren't formed, and they're going to be able to process that and, and understand all the nuances and implications of the behavior later. It's ridiculous. Now, if you can think of anything deviant and dark, somebody else already has and has created a forum online to post it, to publish it, to promote it, to, to expose it. So I'm aware that there are these comprehensive sexuality education programs that are emerging out there that are teaching children to explore, engage in sexual behaviors and activities that are pleasurable and whatever they want to do. That kind of early exposure for children is damaging to their development, to their, both their social and sexual development that inhibits their ability to have healthy, sexual, emotional relationships later on in life. When sexual freedom is the priority, when people are encouraged to begin sexual activity at an early age, to explore and to experiment with different partners, then sexual health suffers. <laughs> It is a normal, natural response for your body to um, respond to another naked body that way. But it's just not the right time for someone so young. There's no stop valve. It's experience all the sex you want. If it were a cake, it would be eating a chocolate cake at every meal. Infection, cancer, infertility, unwanted pregnancy. It is primarily girls and women who suffer the consequences of early sexual activity in multiple partners. That's not sexist. That's biology. If they could put, connect the dots and see that our children are being sexualized so early that they are developing unhealthy body image and sexual relationship images of what that should be like. In an attempt to provide it for adults has fallen into the hands of children and uh, adolescents in a way that is seriously destructive to their own emotional and sexual development. There's no question that pornography leads to the denigration and the demeaning of women, no question. Because the ideation is such that women are subservient. Their job is to only satisfy men either as a slave or as a sexual toy or as a prostitute. A lot of people today, particularly in the United States, think of pornography as nothing more than skin flicks. And they dismiss it as people being too uptight, prudish, and so forth. If they say anything against pornography, they have absolutely no comprehension of the degrading aspect of so much of today's pornography. 14-year-old boy goes on his phone, text, sexts, different girls. His language was so obscene, 
so vulgar, calling them names that are inappropriate, where did he get the ideation that this is all they are good for? It was pornography. And the objectification of women today, I think, is one of the major problems we face in cultures around the world. All these people that I was looking at, I was making them seem, you know, like sexual objects rather than people. It's surprising that many of those who are seeking to improve the status of women are passive or accepting of pornography, which is so demeaning to women. Shelley Lubin, who now works uh, on the good side and, and, and helps uh, fight pornography, former pornography actress, said many actresses admit, actresses admit they've experienced sexual abuse, physical abuse, etc. She says the same horrible violations we experience then we relive in front of the camera and we hate every minute of it. So also the bridge study showed of the top 250 porn titles, 90% of them depict violence against women as defined by slapping, hitting, hair pulling, gagging, choking, and name calling. The more violence and abuse that is depicted in pornography um, has a greater sell value on the internet. Pornographers know this and they push this. Do the men that watch that um, just decide, hey, um, I can watch this but it's all fantasy. It's not real. It is real. The women are actually experiencing what's on the screen. So you need to understand that this is someone's mother, this is someone's daughter, this is someone's sister. And you wouldn't want your mother or daughter or sister to be viewed in that way. We know, for instance, from the HALT meta-analysis, which did look at multiple studies and did conclude that yes, men who view pornography uh, are more accepting of the rape myth, that women enjoy rape and want it. Today, violence against women is, is on the increase. Rape is on the increase. In the UK, uh, the uh, government has identified uh, a, a substantial number of child-on-child -child victims who were harmed because of the pornography consumption of the perpetrator. I have had uh, cases where the pornography addiction in a, a man progressed to the point where he violently raped his own daughter. Most of the individuals that I work with, their desire and appetite for, for seeking somebody like a prostitute can had its origins in their exposure to pornography. Victims of prostitution and violence and, and trafficking will tell you that the industry has gotten so much more uh, difficult it, because the men are demanding much more violence than they ever did before. They seem out of control. They really don't want to be doing the things they're doing. They love their families and they want to maintain a level of love and connectedness there, but their compulsion and their addiction uh, through pornography drives them into these promiscuous relationships, to prostitution, and it's devastating to them. The pornography is fueled by the women who are trafficked. Uh, they're the ones who are used to make the movies that are so popular that, you know, the videos are sold around the world. More than 11,000 a year are uh, developed in comparison to 400 that, uh, movies that are produced in Hollywood. Ultimately, I realized he'd been with these women from another country in, a, you know, a sex club. You just had sex with women, like sex trafficked women, prostitutes? And he looked at me almost like he didn't know. Almost like it didn't click in his head until I said that. And he thought, oh. Women are very vulnerable in undeveloped countries where uh, the traffickers, the criminals come in and they say to the women, we can make you a movie star. And of course they start by uh, saying you have to do this to get a foot in the door. Uh, they end up making the terrible porn movies and uh, becoming prostitutes in a uh, brothel somewhere, in a bar somewhere. Detailed stories that just are so painful when I think about the woman on the other side of what he had done. And, you know, now when we talk about it, I see the pain in his eyes. 
And any country in the world that legalizes prostitution has more sex trafficking. It creates a permissive attitude and an attitude of further disrespect for women. Lauren Bethel said sexual trafficking is the exploitation of vulnerability. In other words, uh, women who, if they could choose to do something else, they would. So pornography creates the demand for prostitution and trafficking, and that's so important to understand. I think sex trafficking isn't just a foreign problem, something that happens in another country, somewhere else. It was going on in my neighborhood down the street from me. I can point them out, I know what to look for. He was working with a pimp who had been imprisoned, and he said, tell me how you find the girls that you use for your movies. And the pimp said, oh, it's easy. I just go to the malls. And he said, most teenage girls and preteen girls will go with their friends. If I see a girl who's alone, I go up to her and I say, hey, you've got beautiful eyes. He said, if she looks at me and says, thank you, I let her go on because I know that she's not vulnerable. But if she looks down at her shoes and says, no, I don't have pretty eyes, he says, I know I've got her. It's impossible to be searching out adult pornography on the internet without finding child pornography. And people will say, oh no, I never look at child pornography. And I say, oh really? You mean you've never seen a woman who's 17 and a half years of age? What about a 16 year old, a 14 year old? I was speaking in Arizona a few years ago and uh, a prosecutor was there who prosecuted obscenity and sex crimes there in Arizona. And he's, he called adult pornography the gateway drug for child porn. And they're arresting many married men, grandparents, many high school kids, because they don't distinguish between adult and child pornography after a time. So they're trying to make actresses look either pubescent or even prepubescent to sculpt those brain tastes younger and younger. That accounts for the worldwide uh, boom in child pornography, I believe. This consumption of adult pornography on a steady basis, where the brain looks and needs, looks for and needs harder material. One of my responsibilities was to work at a children's home where the children were court adjudicated away from their parents because the parents had used them for prostitution purposes and child pornography purposes. So these parents had actually taken pictures of their children and put them on the internet, okay, for the sale. They had also sold their children at different parties and things for sexual favors. Um, it wasn't just one or two kids. We were dealing with 50, 60, 70, 100 different children who had had this take place in their lives. In more developed countries, the runaways, the castaways, the throwaway children are the ones who are so vulnerable because the criminal networks know where they are, they know how to find them, and they prey on them. Uh, the experts say that a child who runs away will probably be in the hands of a criminal network within 48 hours. Uh, individuals that uh, commit crimes against children, for example, sexual crimes against children, uh, report to a high uh, percentage that their issues began with pornography, that they find themselves needing more stimulation from things that they would never have originally uh, described as being sexually arousing to them. Every country should have laws prohibiting the distribution of adult and child pornography. Now, many people argue, well, it should be just child pornography. Adult pornography, you should do what you want people should have that right. But when we know that looking at adult pornography leads many to child pornography, we have to go back to the source of the crime, and it's, it's adult pornography. When I walk into a room, I don't think, who in here struggles with pornography? Now I think, who in here hasn't encountered pornography in their lifetime? It is going to continue, and it's going to continue to take lives and drain them of every ounce of happiness. We need to do something about it. Knowledge is power. I, I firmly believe that, particularly with this, this addiction. The more people learn about the addiction, about the chemistry that happens in the brain during the addiction process and what an addict goes through, 
the more they will be able to be a support. I think it's so important for those that are struggling to always remember that there's not anything that's happened to you that you can't heal from. I finally see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and I know that there is for everyone. There's a great um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross quote about beautiful people. And she says that beautiful people just don't just happen, that the most beautiful people we have known have known despair and loss and misery and suffering. No one said it would be easy, but they said it would be worth it. And I can testify in my life that I've done you know, intense amounts of work, but where I am now, I, I, there's no place I'd rather be in. It's time for us to take very seriously what's happening in our cyber world, in our cyber universe. Just wake up to the fact that our children, our young adults, and our adults are all in this new, uh, brave new world, if you will. Things are not what they used to be even 10 years ago. Pornography is a universal solvent that dissolves emotion, family, marriage, and government. Indeed, it destroys our humanity. The war for safe families and decent communities is a winnable war. You are not too late to the battle. All hands on deck. The battle is on. We need you. We need your time, your energy, your efforts, your interest. Please join us in this fight for sanity and serenity, for peace and prosperity, for today and for all our tomorrows. I am on a mission now to spread to all the world, to all the women, to anyone that will hear me. If we can all come together, and if we can all rally around and not be afraid to talk about it, and not be afraid to get educated, and not be afraid to work together and fight for the common good, then we will all start healing and our society will become better and will become stronger.